Ready? Joy has come, amen! <laughs> so, how many of us have a big dream? Yeah. Some of us dream about relationship. Maybe one that we're looking for, one that we're already in. Some of us have dreams around career calling. The big dream that we're called to, that thing that we know we're called to do. Do we share our dreams with other people? How many of us keep our dreams quiet to ourselves? How many people share those dreams with other people? Sometimes there's a fear that if we share our dream, we might be disappointed. It might not come out the way we want it to. We might be afraid that people might think we're crazy. Um, how many of us have the utter audacity to dream about having all our toys in a rocket ship going to the World Series. Is that not an awesome dream? That is like unlimited power, right? Now why is it that as children we have that incredible, unlimited, there's no need for worrying about what's possible, just this unlimited ab ability to just dream like that? And then how is it that over the years, little by little, we kind of get that weaned out of us and our dream has to be realistic. And, you know, you may be able to go to the World Series, but, you know, you're going to have to go in a car. You're not going to be able to take all your toys. You just can't take your toy, you know. We kind of get our dreams kind of taken out of us. We're starting a series about dreaming big. Jesus invites us to dream even bigger than RJ, even bigger than Roman, even bigger than Amelia. To dream the dreams that are in our hearts, to dream the purpose that God has created us for, and giving us the power to make it happen. Now over the next three weeks, or the next four weeks, we're going to look at being the dream. And we're going to look at dreaming together. And we're going to look at dreaming beyond the borders, beyond the boundaries. All of this is in the first and the first part of the second chapter of Acts, where Jesus calls his disciples together to dream big. Now today we're going to focus on the first five verses of the first chapter of Acts, which was just read for us, which is about preparing for the dream, about the preparations that it takes to begin not only to dream the dream, but to live the dream. And what's in those first five verses, and the direction we're going to move this morning, is going to be first dreaming big, and then preparing to act, and then receiving the power. And that sets us up then to be the dream. So, dreaming big. Why should we dream big? Why is it so important for us to dream big? I've been, that's a rhetorical question. <laughs> we'll come back to it later. Um, I've been rereading a book called Exponential, which we read as a leadership team and then as a vision team. A year ago, we were in the process in, as a church uh, through our connecting council of, uh, first of all, dreaming big. We talked about the big dreams, and then we talked about reproducing leaders and reproducing groups and reproducing sites. And then a year ago, in our connecting council, we came out with a vision of uh, being a Holy Spirit-led movement, mm -hmm. together with the Holy Spirit, becoming a movement of Christian discipleship communities in the Bronx and New York and beyond. And this dream is very much connected to and inspired by the dream in Acts, where Jesus calls his disciples to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And as we were reading that, as we were talking about this book, um, 
we began to really look at what are the ways to become that dream. So as I've been rereading it, I was reading the first chapter about dreaming big. And Dave Ferguson, the guy that wrote this book, said that he drew his dream on a napkin in a restaurant. He drew a shape of the city of Chicago, and he began drawing circles in where he felt called to put in worship sites all across the city. And then he put that napkin in his book, and there it sat for four years. He never shared the dream with anyone. He and his brother started a church, and he never shared the dream with his brother. And then one day, a member from that church went to lunch with him, and the, the member said, so what is the big dream? Like, if we could do anything we want, what would it be? And Dave just sat silent. He had the napkin with him. He hadn't shared it with anyone. And the guy pushed him. He said, come on, Dave, what's the big dream? So for the first time in four years, he pulled out the napkin. And he shared it with the guy. And he began to describe the dream as he looked at the napkin. And the guy looked up at him and he says, you can totally do this. And he said in that moment, the dream became real. And over the next 10 years, in fact, that dream has become real. Now, uh, Tupac said... <laughs> It's our dreams that are real. Now, I think if we thought about what reality is in our society of mass incarceration, of kids not getting to live their dreams, if we thought about all of what reality is and what we've taught to believe is reality or what we've been taught to believe is the only way that things can be. Because that's often, a lot of times people in power won't try to justify the way things are as being right but they will justify them as the only way things can be, given the realities of our society. So what if reality was wrong? And what if those dreams that we have inside us are real? And what if all the barriers and the things that try to stop us from dreaming our dreams and being our dreams were to be erased in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus brought a dream to his disciples. And he taught them to dream in a big way. And he taught them that even death cannot stand in the way of your dream. Because, in fact, while Jesus was teaching this big dream, he had already died. <laughs> and as the first few verses of Acts tell us, through the Holy Spirit, Jesus began to instruct his disciples and shared with us them a dream that you are going to receive the power of the Holy Spirit and you are going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, if death can't stop our dreams, what can? Jesus began to share with them a process of preparing to live their dreams. And in that process, he shared with them the importance of dreaming, I mean, dreaming beyond death, dreaming to the ends of the earth. That's a big dream. And if we allow ourselves 
to dream that dream that is well up. And it's a little different for each one of us because each one of us has a little different gift, a little different take on reality, a little different way of observing the world, a, a little different sense of, of what we have to offer the world. But if we were allowed to dream as individuals and as a community and then begin to live into that dream, what could possibly stop us? So Jesus begins to talk to them about preparation, preparing to live the dream. For 40 days, Jesus appeared to them, instructed them through the Holy Spirit, was with them as they ate, was encouraging them to stay together, talked about baptism, <coughs> talked about the Holy Spirit. For a period of 40 days, they prepared for this transition. Now, as long as Jesus had been with them in the flesh, you know, they were pretty bold. They were growing in faith. Things were going pretty well. But when he was arrested, they kind of pulled back. They went into hiding. But he was encouraging them to prepare now for this transition where Jesus is not going to be physically with them. They are going to lead the movement. You know, they had never even imagined themselves doing anything but fishing and farming and some of the stuff they did. They didn't imagine them themselves going to villages and preaching and healing and teaching and doing all the things they had done. And now they're going to do it even without Jesus as their, their uh, immediate in the flesh leader. They are going to take leadership. So there's a 40-day period of transition here. Now think about Moses. 40 days on the mountain, received the Ten Commandments. Think about Elijah, 40 days in the wilderness without food before his meeting with God, where he saw and heard that still small voice. Think about Jesus starting off his ministry, 40 days in the wilderness after his baptism, before he came out and announced that the reign of God is among you, repent and believe in the good news. So 40 days is like a symbolic time of completion. It's a full time of preparation. It's enough time to get ready for what it is that we're called to do. Meditation. During those 40 days, Jesus instructs them through the Holy Spirit. When you're going to get prepared for your big vision, when you're going to get prepared for the thing that you're called to do, you may need to learn some things. You may need to get instructed. You may need to get some new teaching. You may need to go to some workshops. The kingdom of God was at the heart of what they were sharing. They needed to be well versed in it. As, as Bob Dylan used to say, I might as well quote someone from my generation. As Bob Dylan used to say, I will know my song well before I start singing. So we've got to know our song. We've got to know our vision before we start sharing it. So there's instruction that happens during this time. Jesus encourages them to stay together. This is going to be a communal dream. He wants them to pray together, eat together, worship together, wait together for the Holy Spirit. Now as we began to dream in, through our new vision statement and all that, I began to get a sense that there were some things I needed to learn because this was a new vision for me. I had never been a part of a church that had that kind of a vision. As a matter of fact, ever since I started at New Day, I've had to learn new ways of being a pastor because this is a very different kind of church. So one of the first things I did was get myself a coach. And I got a coach that, spe that specialized in multi-site ministry. And he came to New Day one time, and he was so excited by what he saw that he agreed to coach me for free. And I said, hallelujah. <laughs> and then we started some new ministries, because if you get a bigger dream, then it begins to change the way you think. It begins to change the questions you ask. It begins to change the way you pray. It begins to change the way you act, and it begins to change the impact that you make. So even before the dream becomes operational, already it's beginning to change you. If you're going to be a catalyst for change, then what are the ways that we need to change in order to be the change that we're bringing to the community around us? So we started 
a community of the word directly out of that big dream. You know, it's a sense like if we're going to be doing a bigger dream, we're going to have to have more leaders. We're going to have to have more people who can preach. We're going to have to have more people who can do counseling. So we started this community of the Word. I never heard, thought of something like that before. I don't know any other pastors that have anything like that before. But there's something about a new dream that opens up the possibility of some new ways of doing things. So over the last year, we've had uh, five different sermons from five different members here and there are seven more to come and who knows how many more to come from that and that's been a very powerful transformation among us simply because of the dream simply because of the preparing to live the dream Amen. and we're looking at maybe starting a community of the soul where people uh, begin to get trained to use gifts of prayer and and being with one another we can completely rethink what it means to be church because of a bigger dream. So as we prepare to live the dream that God has given us in our individual lives as a congregation, we usually think of dreaming and preparing as active. You know, we've got to make contacts. We've got to organize people. We've got to get to workshops. We've got to send out resumes. We've got to put in our applications. We've got to get recommendations. There's so much to do, to do, to do. But what Jesus invites them to do is to wait. Part of their preparation is waiting. There's this quote from uh, Thoreau. Why should we be in such desperate haste to succeed? and in such desperate enterprises. If one does not keep pace with his or her companions, perhaps it is because he or she hears a different drummer. Let that person step to the music which he or she hears, however measured or far away. There's something in preparing to dream about discernment. There may be a lot we need to get. There may be some things we need to let go of. As Tawana shared so powerfully with us in the dance today. You know, if, if I could let go of those hurts, you know, I, I began to get in touch with some of that. As I got sense that scarf around her neck. You know, what is that scarf that's around your neck? What are those things you've been holding on to for, for 20 years, 30 years? You know, those hurts that we had in adolescence or in early adulthood that have kind of, we've allowed to kind of form us in certain ways. What does it mean to untie that scarf and to just let that scarf down? Is that a part of what it means to spread our wings and begin to soar in the dream that God has called us to? Discerning and, and, and letting go of that which is holding us to the ground, that, that which is shackling us. Letting go of it. <coughs> Waiting, Jesus says, specifically for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the power to dream dreams and to make those dreams come true. The Holy Spirit, as our Henny shared last Sunday, could be a voice. You know, we've been taught to be silent. We haven't uh, been told that we can freely express and so sometimes all these little uh, obstacles come in the way when we feel called to speak and yet can we freely speak our truth can we begin to believe even within ourselves in our own dream it may be that the first person you need to convince is yourself. If I can just allow the truth and get in touch with the truth of the Holy Spirit in me, the God who created me, the God who gave a purpose to me before I was in my mother's womb, if I can get a sense of that person that I have created to be, absent from all the negative voices, absent from all the wrong-headed uh, advice or whatever that has tried to shape me, really get in touch with the fullness of what it is that God's created me to be. Then I can begin to move in the direction of allowing that to happen. The Holy Spirit 
is the power of God to free us and allow us to live the dream that God has placed within us. You know, we don't have these dreams in there just to be frustrated. The dreams are there to, to give wing and to be empowering for other people. And look at people who live their dreams and how inspiring they are for other people to also live their dreams. As I read through this, these verses, I'm really struck by the connections with what Jesus is describing as the kind of community he wants them to prepare in and the process of worship. If you look at all the elements of Jesus is talking about there, he's talking first about instruction. You know, he instructs them in the way of the kingdom of God, which is one of the reasons that we gather every Sunday, to read the word and to get a sense of this way of God that is so different than the way we live in our work lives and school lives and other places in the world, but to really immerse ourselves in that instruction. And then he talks about uh, breaking bread together and that Jesus' presence is in the breaking of the bread. And he talks about appearances of the resurrection of Christ, that the one who is alive, the one who has transcended death, the one who erases all limits to our dreaming is present among us. They talk about baptism. First, the baptism of water that came from John and then the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Worship is about waiting for the Holy Spirit. Amen. Worship is a different kind of activity for some of us. You know, there's, there's some awkwardness. It's kind of like, it's kind of like um, when I was at my last church. It was um, mostly Caribbean church. And they used to have great parties. And I would go to the parties, but I would always leave by 10 before the dancing started. <laughs> because I, just, I was just not going to be caught out there on the dance floor. And one, I think it was after we were there about four years, one, one party, we stayed a little too late. The dancing had started. And this member of the congregation just came up here and just, boom, you are out on the dance floor. And all of a sudden, every, all action stopped. There was this huge circle. Was I'm going, oh my God, help me to move my feet. And so, you know, so there's awkwardness sometimes that we have, I think, around worship. We don't know how to move our bodies. We don't know if we want to raise up our hands. If we do that, maybe somebody might be looking at us and wondering if we become some kind of religious fanatic. Um, you know, we just, we're a little cautious around worship. We're, you know, but the power that's here, and I have experienced this, the power that is here, if we can just enter in and just allow ourselves fully to worship, and fully to feel the music and to enter into the, you know, the forgiveness that was there and the the, you know, the every, the music, and all the different you know, words of the script, we can just allow ourselves to enter into that. There's a power there, waiting for the Holy Spirit. God does not force us. But when we are ready to open ourselves the power is available for us to begin to live our dreams. This is all about love. It's all about joy. It's all about purpose. It's all about fulfillment. Think of the dream that Jesus gave to his disciples. You will be my witnesses. You're going to witness to the love that you've seen. You're going to witness to all the people that have gotten healed. You're going to witness to the fact that I am connecting with you past the grave. You're going to witness to the hope that is in the gospel. That's what you're called to share with people. And you're called to witness out of what you have seen. You're not called to make anything up. You're not called to say any line that anybody gave you. You're called to call it like you have seen it and experienced it. And you're to share that word with everybody. Everybody you see here and there and across the boundaries. And you're going to be empowered in the process. You're going to be empowered to do things. These, these disciples, these men and women never imagined they were going to do the kinds of things that Jesus invited them to do. We are invited to dream big. 
And next week, we're going to talk about being the dream. How do we actually take that step? You know, when Jesus says, you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witness. How do we actually take that step to being the dream? But I want to invite us now and in this week to come to prepare ourselves to live the dream. To prepare ourselves by learning whatever we need to learn. By preparing ourselves to let go of that which we need to let go of. Preparing ourselves by being community with one another. Because the Jesus dream is about togetherness. As hard and messy as that is, as joyful and lovely as it is, we are called to be people of the dream. Are we open to doing that? Yes. Are we open to being the dream? Yes. yes. Are we open to taking a small step past the fear that we have around us and being the dream? Let us pray. Gracious God, you see how we are. We want to live the fullness of who you have called us to be. And yet we're afraid to fully commit. We're worried about what people might say. We're worried about how it might turn out. But oh God, in this moment, we choose despite all of that to live the dream rather than the fear. Knowing that it won't always be easy and knowing there will be times when we'll feel tired and unsure. But choosing that the life we want is the life that is full of purpose and love. And that that is, in fact, the life you've created us to live. So, God, despite our human frailties, we choose to live in faith. To live the dream. Amen. Amen.